So our topic of interest today is postpartum hemorrhage being one of the hemorrhagic emergencies in obstetrics. So postpartum hemorrhage, the same word postpartum hemorrhage, if you break it, means uh, postpartum itself is afterwards or after delivery. But hemorrhage we are referring as the, the bleeding itself, the, the fluid loss, it's what we are calling hemorrhage. Then, uh, looking at postpartum hemorrhage, in definition, so postpartum hemorrhage, we are defining it as uh, the bleeding from the genital tract occurring any time after the delivery of the baby until to the end of hmm, puperium with a blood loss of more than 500 mils or any amount that can diversely affect the condition of the mother. So postpartum hemorrhage occurs soon after delivery, but it can occur any time in the puperial period. But after six weeks, then, if the woman starts to bleed, then we, we, we don't call that as a postpartum hemorrhage. But if it occurs within six weeks post-delivery, then we call it postpartum hemorrhage. Then for it to qualify to be called postpartum hemorrhage, the woman has to, to bleed or to lose blood of more than 500 mils or any amount that can uh, deteriorate the mother's condition took of um, uh, anemic mothers where their, their HB levels it's, uh, it's below then you don't expect them to to lose uh, blood of more than 500 mils then postpartum hemorrhage itself it qualifies uh, in women like who who deliver via SVD uh, when they lose 500 mils, but if they deliver via cesarean section, then it's supposed to be about a thousand mils. But any amount that can deteriorate or diversely affect the mother's condition, then we call it postpartum hemorrhage. So, postpartum hemorrhage, we have got types or what, ref what they refer as classification. We have got the classification of postpartum hemorrhage or, or types of uh, postpartum hemorrhage which are two we have got primary postpartum hemorrhage and the secondary postpartum hemorrhage so when it comes to primary postpartum hemorrhage it's just a bleeding from the genital tract um, occurring within 24 hours of birth of the baby with uh, the blood loss of more than 500 mils or any amount that can diversely affect the mother's condition so um, primary postpartum hemorrhage is the bleeding from the gen, uh, genital tract occurring within 24 hours of hmm, delivery of the baby. But the blood loss should be more than 500 mils via SVD. Then if it's a cesarean section, it should be a thousand at least. Then any amount that can affect the, mother, the mother's condition, it can also be called postpartum hemorrhage. Then, but the key point, the key catching words, it's within 24 hours. Primary postpartum hemorrhage happens within 24 hours. Then let's go to secondary postpartum hemorrhage. So secondary postpartum hemorrhage is just the, the hemorrhage from the genital tract, which occurs after 24 hours following delivery of the baby up to six, uh, six weeks post-delivery. So it's the hemorrhage from the genital tract which occurs after 24 hours following the delivery of the baby up to six weeks post the delivery. So if the woman loses um, the, if the woman loses blood of more than 500 mils after 24 hours of delivery, then it becomes a secondary postpartum hemorrhage. But if the woman loses blood within 24 hours, or uh, post delivery then it becomes primary so what differentiates primary to secondary is the hours or the occurrence itself primary occurs within 24 hours while it's the um, secondary postpartum hemorrhage occurs after 24 hours up to six weeks post delivery the woman can start bleeding um maybe in week four week five but it should be within six weeks post delivery then we call that as a 
secondary postpartum hemorrhage. So that's just a picture illustrating the woman who has just delivered, um, who is in a recovery room as, as she starts to bleed. So if she bleeds more than 500 mils post delivery, then it becomes postpartum hemorrhage. Then let's look at now what are the major causes of postpartum hemorrhage. So the major causes of postpartum hemorrhage, they are, they are classified as four T's. These four T's, they're the ones that we are calling, one, it's tone, two, it's tissue, three, it's trauma, four, it's thrombi. Tissue, tone, trauma, and thrombi. Those are the four T's that cause postpartum hemorrhage. Remember, these are the major causes, but they are not the predisposing factors when it comes to postpartum hemorrhage. So let's talk of uh, um, each one by one. So we'll start with the same tone. So tone, when it comes to the first T, which is tone, they are referring as to atonic uterus. It's the uterus that, that is failing to contract. So what can predispose the, 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 the atonic uterus? So to, for, for a woman to have an atonic uterus, one, we are saying it's over distension of the uterus. Such uh, example given, we see uh, over distension of the uterus, mainly in um, in uh, in multiple gestation or in polyhydrominous, where if those muscles they are over distended, they lose their elasticity, they lose their ability to contract, such that they lead to atonic uterus and they cause postpartum hemorrhage. Then the other one is. Relaxation, relaxation of the uterine muscles. What can cause relaxation of the uterus, uh, uterine muscles, like um, uh, drugs or anesthetic drugs? When the woman is sedated or sedative drugs, actually, they suppress the uterine muscles. They suppress the contraction. So if those uterine muscles they are suppressed or they are relaxed, then it can lead to postpartum hemorrhage such that. Uh, it will cause the atonic uterus. Then the third one, the third predisposition of um, atonic uterus is uh, a full bladder. A full, a full bladder normally interferes with the contractions. So if those contractions they are inhibited, meaning the, the uterine muscles will fail to contract. Remember after the woman delivers that placenta site, on the placenta site there, they need to, to ligate those blood vessels or to arrest those blood vessels so that the woman, the placenta site stops to bleed. But if there's full blood, that they, meaning there will be the contractions that are going to be interfered. Then the other predisposition is a retained product of conception. So this retained product of conception, you find that um, as, you are, as you are delivering, if there is any... Um, product of conception which has remained inside meaning there will be no ligation of those blood vessels the the maternal uh, body will take uh, as the same product which has remained inside as uh, as a living thing so it will continue supplying blood such that uh, it will cause postpartum hemorrhage and uh, causing failure of the uterus to contract then the other predisposition is um, antipartum hemorrhage. So antipartum hemorrhage, it can cause a postpartum hemorrhage. So this can, this may just lead to loss of coagulation factors. Remember in, um, in the placenta abruptia there, where there is abruptia placenta, there is loss of the same coagulation factors. Then talk of uh, placenta previa in the same APH. You find that if the placenta attaches itself in the lower segment or, or in the lower pole of the uterus, the, the lower pole is less vascularized or there are uh, less uterine muscles there which will like get the blood vessels after the delivery of the placenta such that the woman will just continue bleeding and the uterus will not contract for, for, for that matter. Then anemia. 
anemia being a predisposition anemia they is it's because of the same reduced oxygen and the um oxygen cap carrying capacity remember for for the contraction for a contraction to happen they need to be presence of oxygen and nutrients but if someone is malnourished meaning there is a little oxygen i mean a little glucose which is there and because of a person having anemia there is a reduced oxygen carrying capacity such that it will lead to atonic uterus and causing postpartum hemorrhage then these are um, a uh, grand multiparity they are a predisposition to postpartum hemorrhage because there is this woman has born a number of uh, children or babies so there is that loss of elasticity or loss of muscle tone which which causes the the, the failure of the uterus to contract and causing the 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 atonic uterus leading to postpartum hemorrhage so there can be weakness in contractility so precipitate labor it's because of the same uh, muscle exhaustion the muscles are, are going to be tired such that they will deplete whichever whatever uh, glucose that it had such that it will lead to a uh, weak weakening of the placenta i mean weakening of the uterus to contract so these four things they lead to uh, they cause they lead to uh, atonic uterus and cause postpartum hemorrhage they are just a predisposition of atonic uterus and the causing postpartum hemorrhage so let's look at the second t which is tissue so tissue the first predisposition is having a retained product of conception so this if after the revive there is something which has remained meaning there is continuous blood supply to the same tissue which has remained and the woman is going to bleed of more than 500 mils then we'll classify it as a postpartum hemorrhage then there are these now uh, other predisposition like placenta anomalies or placenta abnormalities like placenta accreta placenta increta and pecreta so in creta what we what we call placenta accreta as well as the placenta just attach itself firmly in the uterine wall whereas it can be a challenging thing as you deliver in the third stage of labor but you can normally uh, do manual removal of the placenta then you can deliver the placenta accreta then the second predisposition is the same placenta increta where now it dips into the myometrium or the uterine muscles such that as you are forcing to deliver the placenta they can be retained product of conception such that the woman will continue bleeding then placenta um pecreta it's where now the the the, the placenta has inserted itself or it inserted itself passing through all the layers of the uterus and going to adjacent now organs it attaches itself to, to those adjacent organs but the, the mode of delivery of such such a placenta it's via 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 cesarean section it's better you manage this uh, condition in theater then let's look at the third t which is trauma so trauma we're just referring to any tears or laceration which the woman can sustain uh, during the delivery of the baby so the first uh, so the first um, the first predisposition of trauma is uh, cervical tears Whereas maybe the woman can be pushing before the full dilatation of the cervix. As the woman is pushing, meaning if the woman is pushing uh, on on a cervix which is not fully dilated, she can sustain uh, these cervical tears. Then she can bleed, bleed until death if not managed uh, quickly. Then the other predisposition if is the vaginal lacerations these vaginal lacerations they can be due to maybe rigid muscles or maybe in more presentation like in OPP or face presentation because of those uh, large diameters of the fetus or the, the presenting uh, diameters which are large they can cause the vaginal laceration then when it comes to perineal tears as the predisposition that's where we see 
men who are affected in perineal tears that was uh, mouth gravity i mean prime gravidus because of those rigid muscles and um, uh, by not controlling the head during the delivery it can cause perineal tears or oh. then the the fourth predisposition is vulva or labia tears or lacerations this they can be due maybe you are delivering uh, the big babies or these microsomic babies or maybe it can the other reason can be due to precipitate labor whereas there is rapid expulsion of the of the fetus or of the baby so if there is a rapid expulsion of the fetus or baby it can cause uh, vulva vulva and labia tears then the the last one but not not the least it's a uh, ruptured uterus it can cause postpartum hemorrhage in such a way that uh, what can cause the the uterus to rupture it's because maybe misuse of oxytocin or overdose uh, use of oxytocin as you use overdose of, of oxytocin there can be um, hyper stimulation of the con of the uterus or contractions which can cause the uterus to rupture at times it can be due to obstructed labor as the unidentified a uh, thing if you obstructed labor it's not identified at the right time meaning it can predispose the woman to have ruptured uterus in cpd which will cause uh, obstructed labor which is going to lead to the same uh, woman ha in having postpartum hemorrhage so that was our our third t which is trauma so the predisposition uh, uh cervical tears vaginal laceration perineal tears vulva and labia lacerations or tears then even ruptured uterus as the cause of or the predisposition of trauma leading to postpartum hemorrhage then the the fourth one it's thrombine referring as to coagulation theory so we are saying any condition that can interfere with it, the blood clotting mechanism the normal blood blood clotting mechanism it can lead to postpartum hemorrhage such example given we have got dic or uh, hypofibro hypofibrogenemia where this condition they can be brought by the hypertensive disorders aph even iufd this condition mentioned condition they can cause um, dic other reasons of uh, coagulation failure which can lead to postpartum hemorrhage it's uh, congenital blood clotting defects if um, you have got these congenital uh, blood clotting defects meaning you can you you are predisposed in bleeding after uh, delivery or any cuts you find that you bleed for a longer period of time before the blood will start to clot so any congenital blood clotting defect it can lead to coagulation failure and cause postpartum hemorrhage now let's look at the the signs and symptoms of postpartum hemorrhage what are the clinical manifestation of postpartum hemorrhage so the first one being visible bleeding in the vagina so if there is maybe cervical tears uh, vaginal laceration or tears the woman will start bleeding and or maybe not only these tears from the vagina uh, also the cervical but even those retained product of conception meaning the woman is just con is continuous bleeding so there will be visible blood in the vagina that will be seen so it's it's the same due to the un uncontracted uterus then they can be visible bleeding in the vagina then the other the other sign is passage of large clots so as you massage the uterus you find that there can be passage of the same clots remember if um, if the the uterus hasn't contracted and it's it, it is continuous bleeding inside the blood won't be draining but it will be con uh, concealed inside whereas it now starts clotting making some clots so as you rub up the contractions or as you stimulate contractions then you will see visible passage of large clots so they can be pala or cyanosis it's because of hypoxia 
then signs of shock like cold clammy skin they can be hypotension tachycardia the woman will be restless so these all these they are signs of shock then blurred vision it can be due to this uh, cerebral hypoxia so because of the woman who has bled um, a big amount of um, of blood you find that uh, the blood supply now to the brain is going to be reduced such that you to cause a woman to have a bright vision then you find that the other sign will be enlarged uterus enlarged uterus and it will feel bulgy because the uterus hasn't contracted it will be more like sub involution of the uterus then uterus is going to be feel it's going to feel or oh, it's it's going to enlarge such that uh, there is accumulation of blood even in there then the other reason or the other signs of postpartum hemorrhage it's altered level of consciousness which may with the woman it may even become restless or drowsy because of the same uh, an amount of blood the woman has bled so we now look at uh, the immediate management of postpartum hemorrhage what is the immediate management of postpartum hemorrhage of course uh, we we'll start with the aims. What could be the aims of our management? One is just to identify the cause of PPH. Two is to uh, to to resuscitate the woman. Number three is to stop the bleeding. For intervention, you can say it's to prevent infection, and last but not the least, it's to prevent complication on the give psychological care to the woman. Then the first thing in our immediate management is to call for help. As you call for help, meaning you are shouting PPH, so that you summon together the, the, the medical and non-medical staff. So these uh, medical and non-medical staff, they can comprise with uh, other senior midwives or just the other midwives or nurses or other medical personnel. But, but uh, they should include an, uh, an aesthetist, an obstetrician, maybe a pediatrician in case of anything of the baby. So this a team of uh, this emergency team, this emergency team, they need to be summoned as soon as you identify the PPH. Then the other reason, the other intervention, you need to wake calm and skillful. Because if you are not calm, meaning you are going to, you, are not, you will fail to manage the, the same condition, postpartum hemorrhage. But uh, as you wake calm and uh, apply your skills in a calmly way, Meaning you you are, you'll be able to give instruction, give orders to those summoned people. Then, what psychological care do we have to give to the woman? As the second point in our immediate management, we have to give psychological care. Psychological care. Remember, this woman is wondering why she has started seeing other medical personnel who are who are attending to her. So you need to explain what has happened, so that you gain her cooperation. The thing, the, the the interventions that you have done so far, and what you are yet to do, because she can be wondering. But if you exp you explain all these to to her and to the relatives, meaning she will, she's going to cooperate, and you you set up your interventions as quickly as possible. Then the other thing you need to 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 do a quick assessment. You need to do a quick assessment in your immediate management. But what quick assessment are we talking about? One, you um, need to assess the level of consciousness. You need to assess the, the level of consciousness. But what do we use? You can use even a glycocoma scale. Remember, we talked about the woman uh, exhibiting the signs of shock. So you need to know if this woman is fully conscious or she is unconscious by use of a glycocoma scale. So assess the level of consciousness. Then check the airway. Are there any signs of obstruction? Then check the breathing. Check the, the respiratory pattern. Is the woman cyanosed? You are doing a quick assessment so that you know the subsequent uh, interventions that you are going to do. Then check the circulation. How is the BP? How is the pulse? How is the temperature? Then Apart from those uh, assessments, other assessments that you can do, you have to check the amount of bleeding. 
So you have to collect it in the assessment of uh, amount of bleeding. You have to check uh, or you have to collect uh, the blood and measure it. And also estimate the blood which is on the sold linen or sold uh, materials and estimate the blood loss. So that's how you would do your quick assessment. You assess for the level of, the level of consciousness, you check for the airway, you check for the breathing, you check for the circulation, or you check for the BP, uh, pulse, and temperature. Then from there, you do your assessment also the, on the amount of bleeding as you collect all, all the blood and measure it so that you estimate the blood loss. Then from there, you have to resuscitate the woman using the principle A, B, C, D. Resuscitate the woman using the principle A, B, C, D. Then, how do we resuscitate? Remember that uh, when it comes to, um, to resuscitating, as you follow your principles A, B, A, B, C, D. When you start with A, it's airway. So on A, you have to ensure that there is no obstruction. And the position has what in a well position position her in a well positioned, uh, in a well positioned so that you promote the patent airway so that there's no obstruction. This woman can should be um, breathing normally. Then on B, which is breathing. There should be no difficult breathing. E.g., like the woman should be shouldn't be cyanosed, and the saturation levels they should not be less than a ninety. So the saturation levels they should be above ninety, and the woman should not be cyanosed. Meaning, if the woman is cyanosed, and there the is low saturation, meaning this this woman is having a difficult breathing. So you can even provide you O2 by mask just for perfusion. Then open maybe nearby windows. You open nearby windows so that you promote this this good air circulation. Then on your C, which is circulation, on your C, which is circulation, you double cannulate the patient for easy access of intravenous uh, intravenous access. Then before you you start loading the patient, make sure that you collect samples. So your hematological investigation, one, they are going to include you collect blood from a hemoglobin, two, you collect blood from a, uh, for grouping, three, you collect blood for grouping, four, you collect blood for hematocrit, five, uh, you do your platelet count, you can even do your uh, bedtime clotting. Then. After now you have collected these samples, these samples they should be sent as quickly as possible to their respective labs so that the results can be given back to you and you know the, ne the next step in case of the patient uh, in need of transfusion. So these results eh, will help us. Then as we load, it's better we start with the IV then give um, the preferable, it's hemacil. So start a hemacil IV then because we had double cannulated the patient you can even uh, give the other hand with uh, with the oxytocin drip so infuse oxytocin maybe in the lingers that did then the other hand put hemacil then if the HB is less than uh, 10 grams per deciliter you can even transfuse if they severe bleeding and the HB is less than uh, 10 grams per deciliter, please let's transfuse. Then make sure that eh, we elevate the legs of the woman to allow enough blood to flow in the vital organs, like eh, in the brain. So we just have to elevate a bit of the legs so that eh, we allow more blood or enough blood to flow. Uh, to the vital organs such as the brain but uh, we are cautioned uh, we are not allowed we are discouraged of uh, lifting the, the the foot end of the bed because if you lift the foot end of the bed meaning you are preventing the the pouring out of the same blood which is in the uterus but uh, um, retain it retaining it back in the uterus 
and the preventing contractions. So if blood is left in the uterus, meaning the, there will be interference of the normal contractions, but uh, just elevate a bit, but do not lift the foot end of the bed. So make sure that uh, you avoid lifting up the foot end of the bed just to, to, to promote the, the same contractions. Then on D, which is drugs, that's where now we give drugs such as oxytocin. You can even give oxytocin 10 international units IM. Then you can give methotrexate, uh, methotrexate acid. Also not methotrexate, I meant uh, trinexamic acid. You can give trinexamic acid 1 gram IV. Then you can give uh, egometrin 0.2. IV or IM, but it shouldn't exceed uh, two doses. As you give egometrin, make sure that the patient is not hypertensive because its effect it constrict the vessels. But if you give this uh, egometrin, then it can worsen the condition, and you can even end up losing the the the, the woman. Then after you have resuscitated the woman, now that's where now. You need to identify the cause. You need to identify the cause. What has caused the same postpartum hemorrhage? What has caused the same postpartum hemorrhage? So, get history from the patient. If she's conscious, if she delivered from home, what time she delivered, and if um, um, the, the placenta was complete as it was delivered, was the placenta complete and what time did she start bleeding by so doing it will help you to know where to start from as you as you manage the same postpartum hemorrhage then make sure that you exam, exam, uh, examine the, the uterus just to rule out the, the same sub involution check if the uterus has contracted or if the uterus is uh, involuting then check the state of the blood there is, is it is there any full bladder there? At times, the cause of PPH, it can just be a full bladder. But as you drain that uh, urine, you find that there can be initiation of those contractions and those blood vessels which are bleeding there, they, they will be arrested and managing the same postpartum hemorrhage. And also check the bed canal for any laceration or tears so that you know where to start from. So as you identify the cause now, we will now go to stop the bleeding. How do we stop the bleeding? So we can only stop the bleeding according to the cause. You stop the bleeding according to the cause. So the first one, how do we manage the atonic uterus? How do we manage the atonic uterus? One, make sure that you empty the bladder if there is full bladder. Remember we talked, uh, we said that... Uh, a full bladder interferes with the normal contractions. A full bladder interferes with the normal contractions. So empty the bladder and initiate those contractions. Then try to, to stimulate the uterus or to rub, to rub up the contractions in the circular motion at the pandas and try to initiate the contractions. Then you can also give uh, these oxytoxic, oxytoxic drugs such as oxytocin. So you can give a uh, 10 international unit of um, oxytocin IM, and the other other they can be infused in uh, in a lingus ducted IV started at 60 drops per minute. Then you increased uh, the next you give uh, you infuse the 10 international unit in one liter or a 20 international unit in one liter. Then you run it at 40 drops per minute. Then as you do that, make sure to check if the placenta is there. Check for its completeness. So that uh, you know if there is the cause of postpartum hemorrhage, it can be due to the same retained product of conception. So examine the placenta. Then as we manage PPH, we are encouraged to put the, the baby on the mother's breast so that there can be stimulation uh, to the posterior pituitary gland. Uh, so that it can release or secrete uh, oxytocin. 
So as you put the baby on the mother's breast, there's that that, that stimulation that will cause production of more oxytocin and helping the uterus to con to contract and involuting it. The other interventions that you can do it by manual compression of the uterus, by manual compression of the uterus. So, uh, just in a brief, uh, how you you do this by manual compression, you you make more like a con, uh, a con finger. Then you insert in the vagina, targeting the the posterior, the uh, the anterior part of the vagina. Then make a fist. Then put your your left hand on the fundus. Then compress the uterus. By so doing, then you are compressing those blood vessels. Then they will stop bleeding. Then managing the same postpartum hemorrhage. Then if this fails, you can even do uh, you you can even do um use the same balloon uh, uterine balloon tamponade UBT. This is just a simple material. Whereas you insert in the uterus, then you infuse with water. As that distension um, of the balloon infused with water, it will compress those the bleeding vessels and the arresting the, the same blood vessels. If this fails, then try to do the aortic compression. Go on to the, uh, to the umbilicus, two centimeters from the umbilicus, then try to compress there and the, as you check for the femoral pulse. If the femoral pulse ceases, meaning the woman has stopped bleeding, but if this fails, then the only uh, intervention, the only solution here is to manage the woman in theater as you do a, uh, a hysterectomy. So this hysterectomy, they are just going to, to remove the uterus which is causing the same bleeding, then you have managed postpartum hemorrhage. So these are the interventions that you can put in place as you manage an atonic uterus. One is to empty the bladder, you wrap up a contraction, make sure you give oxytocin, IM, and also infuse the um, these the blood expanders like it, um, lingers lactate. Then make sure that you examine the placenta for its completeness. Then put the baby on the uh, put the the, the baby on the breast of the mother then you do a bimanual compression of the uterus then you can even use uh, a uterine balloon tampon it just to compress those bleeding vessels then do an aortic compression if this fails the last option is hysterectomy that's how that's a brief management too, of an atonic uterus then how do we manage uh, if the cause of postpartum hemorrhage is trauma so one, the first thing that you need to do if you are managing trauma as the cause of postpartum hemorrhage, you need to inspect the perineum, inspect the perineum, inspect the vulva, inspect the vagina, and last but not the least, inspect the cervix for any tears or laceration. So that if you identify that the cause is due to vaginal laceration or tears, then you repair as soon as possible. Repair those, but these cervical tears, as you attend to them, you need to have experience how to suture the cervical tears. Then, if the, the cause of trauma is due to ruptured uterus, those uterine tears, they should be repaired in theater with agents. So, uh, uterine tears or ruptured uterus, if it was the cause of postpartum hemorrhage, better managed in theater with urgency without caution so the first thing you inspect the perineum vulva vagina and also the cervix for tears or laceration then suture any tears or laceration if they are present then the uterine tears they should be repaired in the theater with urgency then let's look at the management of tissue the management of tissue if there is anything that had remained inside there which is we're referring as tissue as you as we de, as we delivering maybe the placenta a membrane had remained inside so the first intervention you need first to check the bladder if the bladder is full then if it's full you 
you empty it. Empty the blood that's what you initiate or you promote the contraction. Then you wrap up a contraction or wrap up the uterus so that you initiate those contractions. Then the main interventions that we do if there is retained product of conception is manual removal of the same product of conception. Manual removal of the same product of conception. So make sure as you do these procedures, use sterile gloves just to prevent um, introducing infection there. So use sterile gloves, then make sure that you, you inform the woman as you do these procedures. So do a manual removal of the same product of conception. By so doing, you are going to manage the cause of uh, postpartum hemorrhage if it's tissue. You empty the bladder if it's full. You wrap up the contractions. Then you do manual removal of the product. Of course, giving an informed consent to the woman or giving psychological care to the woman. Then the last... Uh, Management if the cause is uh, coagulation failure. If the cause is coagulation failure, then blood needs to be transfused to the woman. Remember, after receiving those results uh, of the investigations that we do, what we, that we did, they are going to guide us. How are how how are the platelets count? How is the HB of the woman? How is the bedtime clotting? So after those um, results for the investigations, you are going to transfuse. You can even do a, a platelet transfusion. You can even give the woman a frozen plasma or fresh whole blood. By so doing, you are going to manage uh, coagulation failure as the cause of postpartum hemorrhage. So we have come to the end of our... Our presentation, uh, our presentation on postpartum hemorrhage. So don't forget to subscribe on Thrive Academia Con. Not forgetting the topic of interest today was postpartum hemorrhage, where we said it is classified into two. We talk of uh, primary and the secondary postpartum hemorrhage. Then when you talk of the same postpartum hemorrhage, postpartum it's after the delivery then. Hemorrhage, you are referring as to the blood loss or the fluid loss. But more specifically, is the blood loss. So don't forget to subscribe once more. Bye-bye.